Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar on pasture mixes to improve sustainability of organic pasture based dairy production, nutritive quality and dry matter intake by Blair Waldron of the USDA Agricultural Research Service. I'm your host Alice Formiga of eOrganic. For the past 10 years eOrganic has published articles, videos and webinars about organic farming and research and you can find all of them on our new website at eOrganic.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Blair Waldron, who is a plant geneticist at the Forage and Range Research Lab at the USDA ARS in Logan, Utah. They, along with um, he and along with his partner at Utah State University, are working on a Western SARE grant and a NIFA OREI project to improve the sustainability of organic pasture-based dairy. And they have a website which describes those projects at eorganic dot info slash dairy forages and I'll pull up that link at the end of the presentation as well. So with that Blair I'm going to hand over the presentation controls to you. Um, hello I'm Blair Waldron and I'm I thank eOrganic for hosting this webinar and I'm thankful for Alice for that introduction and thank you for joining us. I'm excited about the story that's coming out of this research so look forward to introducing it to you today. Um, as mentioned, this is joint research between ARS and Utah State University and is funded by two great partners, uh, Western Sahara and OREI. Uh, grazing research is expensive to do, so we're especially thankful that they felt that th these projects were important enough to fund. I look at this uh, picture on the um, first slide and I, I'm reminded to say this is where where our research pastures are at, it's in Cache Valley, the home of Utah State University. Uh, Cache Valley is a semi-arid environment in the top of the Wasatch Mountains and it's a beautiful place to do research. Almost all year long, you can look at the mountain tops and see snow, snow caps there and it's, a, it's a, just a nice place to do this type of research. So we look forward to introducing it today. So, um, the outline for today's webinar is I'm going to introduce the project and give a little bit of the background. Then I'll present some specific results that's on the forage quality and the dry matter intake. Uh, talk a little bit about how we did on-farm evaluation to try to validate those results. And then I'll give a few summary remarks. Um, as background, I need to first introduce some previous research that was done by this research team. It was a Western Sahara project and we were evaluating plant and animal performance under tall fescue and tall fescue lagoon pastures. And this was uh, grazed throughout the summer, 112 days, rotational stocking. Um, and there were three Angus cross steers on each pasture. And then we went in in each uh, paddock and determined herbage and the nutritive value. And then at the end of each rotation, we determine the steer growth and gains. And what we found was that as shown on this slide here, where we have our beginning, this is weight gain. So here's the beginning and, and here's at the end of the grazing season, was that this red line here is the tall fescue birds fit trefoil mixture. And it ended up having the highest um, gains for those steers. The blue line alfalfa or tall fescue alfalfa was close but tall fescue first fit trefoil ended up being highest. So we however those gains were not quite as high as we had anticipated or hoped for so we started to look and see what kind of things might be limiting those gains and we and we looked at energy this is net energy and, and we looked at what happened in net energy over the season and the green and the purple lines here are our grass monoculture. The red and blue lines are our grass um, legume mixtures. And, and we can see that legumes for sure increased our energy. We have this mid season energy slump like we might expect. But when we started looking at charts, we found out that even this level of energy was limiting our growth. So we thought about that and we wondered, can we, can we change from tall fescue? Can we add a higher energy grass and add it to those condensed tannins that are in bird's foot trefoil? And I'll talk a little bit about, just briefly more about bird's foot trefoil later. 
but have these condensed tannins and get a complementary effect that will improve both dry matter intake and livestock performance. And so that partially is the background that sets up this research. We, the, we then came up with this project, assembled the team and came up with the project and it's been introduced here today. It's grass, bird's foot, trefoil mixtures to improve the sustainability of pasture-based organic dairies in the Western US. Um, there's a website as, as Alice mentioned, the grant funding and our hypothesis was that uh, these high, if we had high energy grasses in combination of bird's foot trefoil which for those who don't know is a high protein, non-bloating, condensed tannin containing legume that we can maximize our growth and reproductive characteristics in developing dairy heifers. We can improve nutrient cycling, meaning less nitrogen in the urine and increase economic sustainability. This is a large project, a large multidisciplinary team is involved. Um, Dr. Isom and Dr. Creech are co-project directors with myself. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of different specialists on the project. Um, Dr. Thornton with nutrition, Dr. Miller with nutrient cycling, Dr. Peel is our legume specialist. We have Dr. Root as an extension vet, Dr. Allen extension dairy, Dr. Fates and Larson are ag economists. We have, we have reached out to extension people who are working directly with producers and, and we have, um, we've, both of those have retired on us, but their replacements have stepped right in, Jake Catfield and Bracken Henderson. And then a key part of our team is we have three um, participating producers who are organic dairy farmers or, uh, the, or transitioning to organic and that would be Greg Bingham, Mike Wingsgard and Frank Turnbull. And then we've had a, a a bunch of really good graduate students and and their names are listed there today Marcus Rose is going to be mentioned several times as he was graduate student with me collecting this data should also mention maybe our most important team member is Jersey heifers when we initially uh, applied for these grants we were told that the Jersey is the true dairy breed I guess so to speak that that if we use jerseys that we would have the best results and, and actually and so we changed from our original plan to use Holstein and went to jerseys and, and the jerseys actually became a very they were a very good test subject testers I should say easy to work with and and helped us as we set up what is quite complex research in trying to do this grazing research. So today I'm in a um, do give this webinar and talk about herbage nutritive quality and dry matter intake. We have other webinars planned and anticipated. Next month there will be one they'll talk about the heifers and their growth performance. Um, and then in March there'll be one that's about interceding legumes in the grasses. We get that question all the time. April we'll go over the economics of a pasture-based heifer replacement program. Um, in May, we hope to have one on reproductive issues, um, high quality pastures. That's one of uh, our objectives was how will high quality pastures affect fertility and reproduction. And then we'll wrap it up with talking about nutrient cycling and, and environmental con um, benefits of these pastures. So that leads me to then the nutritive quality and dry matter intake. Um, Marcus Rose, he's was a graduate student, he's now with BLM, BLM in Nevada. And basically what I'm gonna be talking about is what happened when we went out in those pastures and clipped lots and lots and lots of samples and analyzed them. And as I was going through the pictures, I, I saw this selfie that Marcus had taken of himself with this Jersey heifer and, and recognized for the first time that they both had the same color of hair. So no wonder he got along with them so well. I appreciate his hard work though on this project. As introduction, there's over three and a half million milk cows in the Western US and organic milk production is the one of the fastest growing segments of the organic market with over 10% consistent growth at 10% in sales each year. And we continually are finding more and more interest in organic and pasture-based dairies. 
throughout the throughout the dairy industry, but particularly in the West. However, pasture-based dairy comes with its challenges. Um, research has shown that there's a milk de production decrease when you go to convert to pasture, with one paper showing a, as up as much as 32% decrease when pasture is 75% of the of the feed. Um, another research study showed that the one of the primary issues there is reduced dry matter intake, and so that becomes the objective of this uh, project. Um, there are plenty of papers that are also showing the energy and the herbage is a major limiting factor, as we had found ourselves in our earlier research. Now, dairy breeds can sometimes be finicky gra grazers and may not eat some of our more traditional pasture species like tall fescue. And this um, came to light to me as I was in walking the pastures with one of our farmer participants and a neighbor of mine, Greg Bingham. And, and he's an organic dairy farmer. And as we were looking at his pastures, he kept telling me that his cows wouldn't eat tall fescue. And I'm a tall fescue breeder, so I didn't like that very well. And told him he was wrong, that they would eat it. It was just growing faster than his cows could eat it. And as we laughed about that, we thought about how to set up some research where we could actually measure that and see, are the cows eating tall fescue as much as they're eating perennial ryegrass or any other grass? And, and so that's part of the um, background to this research that we're doing. So our objectives in the research then, thinking about that a hypothesis, then are to evaluate different grass birchfoot tree foam mixtures versus grass monocultures in a dairy heifer replacement system. And we're gonna compare physical, such as mass and leaf pubescence, and chemical nutritive value characteristics of the herbage, to determine the dry matter intake, and identify then which one of those herbage traits characteristics are affecting dry matter intake by grazing heifers. And then we wanted to validate that on farm. So our treatments are set up as such. We have eight pasture treatments um, on the research facility, a research grazing facility. Um, that's a semi-arid irrigated farm. We had four grass monocultures, including Amazon high sugar perennial ryegrass, quick draw high sugar orchard grass, and cash meadow brome and fawn tall fescue. Then we have those four same grasses mixed with bird's foot trefoil. The tall fescue bird's foot trefoil then becomes our standard for comparison based on our previous study. We're saying that was our gold standard before, and now can we beat that? We have three replications of those treatments, and, and then just to make sure that's clear, this is a sprinkler irrigated farm. Um, the pastures receive three inches of supplemental water every 10 days. They were fertilized, um, the monoculture, everything got 25 pounds of nitrogen of organic approved Chilean nitrate in April before we began the grazing. And then the grass monocultures only received a second application of 25 pounds of N between the second and third grazing rotation. I have this picture of birch foot trefoil in the upper right hand corner here. Um, it did remind me that we, as we started this research, we received some criticism that birch foot trefoil was not persistent, especially in the West. However, we have found that it is extremely persistent, especially under rotational stocking. With a continuous grazing, it may go out because it is a preferred forage, but under rotational stocking and with the right management, which includes a rest period in the fall, We've had no problem with persistence. In fact, it actually increases. This here shows a map of how our pastures are set up. And uh, these red lines, which I'll explain just a minute, are different paddocks for our rotational grazing. So we grazed for 105 days in 2017 and in 2018. Um, each paddock was grazed for seven days and then the animals rotated to a new paddock. And after 35 days, then they returned back to the starting paddock. 
each uh, um, pasture had a stocking rate of three 445 pound starting weight Jersey heifers. Um, we, that stocking rate is very light. We were trying to push for less than 50% utilization of the forage because we didn't want that to be the limiting factor. That wasn't the objective of this study. And then heifers are weighed and, and collect fecal, urine, and blood samples every 35 days. I should make a point here, they are returned to the same pasture. These, the same heifers are always on the same pasture. They don't get to see the other forages. And that's a key point when we start talking about what utilization and um, versus preference. But I mentioned we took a lot of samples out here and then we used a rising plate meter. We'd go across those uh, pastures in a w, fat, uh, w pattern and get the average of 30 measurements to determine um, our forage mass and use that to calculate intake. Because we do that before and after each grazing period. So the difference becomes the apparent intake. Then we analyze nutritive value via NI, NIRS with the um, uh, pasture consortium equations. <coughs> we had a, um, we collected a, a lot of herbage traits, 22 in total, and um, fiber, digestibility, sugars and energy, crude protein ash, and then the amount of condensed tannins in the forage. We also have physical traits such as leaf softness and pubescence, herbage mass and height, herbage allowance, bulk density, and the percent of bird's foot tree foil that is in the forage. Going from there then, I wanna jump right into talking about some of the results and, and what we found. First of all, the, her the rising plate meter. Um, th that's kind of a controversial tool. Some people don't like it. Um, we found it to work very well for us. Uh, small samples, are, there's a lot of variation within these large paddocks. But by taking the average of 30 of these measurements and then forcing the intercept to zero, saying, so we're saying when the rising plate meter is on the ground, there was zero forage there. We were able to find a high correlation with actually what we were sampling and measuring. And so we we're very happy with the results from the rising plate meter. Another thing to talk about is in our area, we, um, these grasses mature very rapidly during that first uh, rotation. And here, picture on the left, we have meadow brome in mid-May, and then in the first week of June, we're already headed out. And all of our treatments uh, did head out um, before we completed our first rotation. They varied in their maturity, but they all did head out. So that made it problematic to take measurements and we did not measure dry matter intake on paddocks four and five in that first rotation. Which brings me to, I wanna talk a little bit about that, the herbage allowance. I will present a number of slides that are set up like this. On the left will be a graph that shows the difference between mixtures and monoculture across the grazing season. Here are the rotations. And, and in this case, I'm gonna show herbage allowance. That'll be defined up here. On the right, there'll always be another graph that uh, shows the individual treatments but set up the exact same. And the size of these graphs will vary depending on the point I need to make. So herbage allowance on these pastures, um, we know in the temperate regions that it, you have this balancing act that you're trying to manage excess forage in the spring versus producing adequate forage in the hot summer. <clears throat> and we were hoping that bird's foot trefoil would help us with the midsummer slump. And you can see here the difference, the bird's foot trefoil did produce more forage during the midsummer. However, what we normally expect in the temperate region is for these grasses to rebound a little bit as we go into late summer and fall. And in this case, they did not. And, and I believe that's, that's gonna be an inherent problem that's gotta be um, addressed with management in pastures is I think we have a, a lack of nitrogen here. A lot of the traditional grafts are under heavy fertilization, so these grasses are able to rebound. I think here we're hurting, for short on nitrogen, 
and the grasses are just not able to rebound. And just something to think about as we move forward. In America, we plant a pasture and, and pass it on to the next generation. In other grazing systems, they'll often rotate through those pastures, replant them, turn, turn that green down and replant them. Um, maybe a little bit of a cultural difference that we may have to try to negotiate to be able to get better production of our grasses. You can see from this pasture that uh, these grasses, you can see that it is impossible to get dry matter intake. A lot of this has just been tromped down. And um, we did graze all the way through the rotation through paddocks four and five before we started back. And we cut this off, so we started back with the clean paddock. We, our on farm producers this year, working with Organic Valley, um, the milk company, they went ahead and swathed their paddocks ahead of the grazing once the grass was at a prime stage and left the swath in the paddock and actually grazed it with the regrowth and they said that worked quite well. So maybe just something that might help with that problem in the future. So as for results here, I just wanted to show this is a parent, DMI will stand for dry matter intake and utilization. And the, and the result is, is that the mixtures overall did increase um, dry matter intake. This is pounds of intake per animal unit per day. And an animal unit was based on, since these animals were growing sometimes at different rates, we converted them all to the end weight, which was 551 pounds. So this is, you could basically say this is pounds of uh, intake per 551 pound heifer. And we were, the mixtures with the birch fit tree foil increased intake. We had three treatments that uh, had the highest intake. That's meadow brome with birch fit tree foil, orchard grass with birch fit tree foil. And then the orchard grass was right up in there also. Our lowest intake was uh, on tall fescue birch fit tree foil, tall fescue and the perennial ryegrass. Sorry, that line's a little bit on there, but one thing that I wanted to point out here is that Bert, the birch with trefoil added to perennial ryegrass increased intake of that treatment, as well as the metal brome, but did not increase the um, treatment, did not increase the tall fescue, which is one of our hypotheses. We thought if we had birch with trefoil and a tall fescue, we'd increase intake. That did not happen. Um, looking at the trend over the season, again, the trend here shows that the mixtures at all, all times during the season pretty much had higher intake than the monocultures. And in this graph, you can see tall fescues down here at the bottom and tall fescue birds for trefoil here. Here's your perennial ryegrass, but it jumps up when you add some birds for trefoil to it. So just like we had seen on the, on the table, it held true throughout the season. So what we conclude is our pasture species differed for dry matter intake. Um, those two treatments that had the greatest, that were the most consumed also had the greatest birch foot trefoil content. And others have found that legumes increase intake and so that was not a huge surprise. Um, dry matter intake of tall fescue was the same as dry matter intake of perennial ryegrass. So I got this in bold, I was right but the dry matter intake of other grasses was also great, was greater than tall fescue. So my friend Greg Bingham was also correct. So we both, we were both right on that. And, and then tall fescue dry, plus birch foot tree foil ended up being less than perennial ryegrass plus birch foot tree foil. So two of our chief questions on this research were answered there. So I'm a, I'm a, I, this, I put this slide in as a placeholder to remind me that I'm about to show a table of a lot of numbers and, and just talk a little bit about statistics, but don't, don't give up on me and don't, don't leave me. <laughs> so I, I'll, try to, I'll try to get through it here. This here, this here chart, it shows, shows a bunch of the nutritive values and there's a lot of numbers there. And I put it there for, for record in case you want to go back and actually find the actual um, value for any of these treatments for the nutritive values. 
And, but what I re just really want to show is what you probably expected is the mixture for the most part has the more favorable nutritive value. And, and we, ex we had hoped for that and that result did come out. So then when we look at that, we wanted to say, okay, we've got all of these variables and we want to now try to explain why are we seeing differences in our dry matter intake? And so we can do a little statistical process called multivariate analysis and take these 22 variables and group them down into some, a fewer number of groups based on how correlated they are. And we know that nutritive value um, traits are highly correlated with each other. And, and so we went through this process and we come up with these six different groups and, and as we do that, then we can look and see which traits were driving those groups. And here's one on, on fiber and energy. Here's one that's more first foot tree foil related and so forth. And then we can run through regression and, and see, okay, can, do these traits explain the difference in the dry matter intake? And we get this value of 0.32 or only explain 32% of the differences in intake. Which leaves us with this question mark. Why? Why? If it wasn't the forage that was different, then what's going on? However, we, we can take those same groups and then we can look at them using a different analysis, conical discriminant analysis, and see if, 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 if we didn't know what the treatments were, all we knew was the fiber, all we knew was... Um, the protein, how tall it was, could we identify those pastures? And we're excited that these, this here in highlighted numbers are the percent of times that metal brome was identified correctly, 93% of the time. And so we were able to identify the pastures 77 to 99% of the time. So that does support that we are seeing differences in our pastures. And it supports that we're seeing differences in dry matter intake, even though we didn't have as high a um, number on the previous analysis. These pastures are different. That was our goal. We wanted to set up pastures that differed in their energy, differed in their tannin, differed in their um, preference, and we were able to do that. Then we go and we start looking at those different groups and we, and we can see what factors are driving the difference among treatments and among dry matter intake. And you don't need to understand much about this table, but it's here just to remind me that the first thing that we found was leaf softness and leaf pubescence. That's the first thing that drove the differences. And pubescence here was probably just maybe herbage differentiation didn't affect intake. I get asked all the time, will animals eat, eat a grass that has hairs on it? And the answer is yes. That doesn't seem to deter them, but leaf harshness does. And fawn tall fescue is an old variety of coarse leaves. And it may have deterred the amount of intake by those heifers on tall fescue. Next, we, we have a fiber and energy. Those were the next two variables that uh, were defining what was happening out there. And as we look at that, our, our monoculture Here's NDF, neutral determinant fiber, and, and our monoculture had higher NDF than our mixture. And higher NDF is always associated with lesser dry matter intake. It's been, it's happened, it's been published lots of times. Um, so it's not surprising here that perennial ryegrass and birchfoot trefoil had the lowest NDF, and perennial ryegrass in itself has second lowest. It's one of the reasons it makes perennial ryegrass such a great grass. It's low in NDF. Um, when, and as grass is mature, the NDF increases. So that's one thing to think about that, that perennial ryegrass was the later maturing grass. Also associated that with that was carbohydrates and our energy. Um, here's our perennial ryegrasses. In a mixture or a monoculture, you can see that it had higher energy. It was supposed to be a high sugar perennial ryegrass, whereas the orchard grass is down here mixed with everything else. 
water soluble carbohydrates, again, perennial ryegrass, here in the monoculture, here with the mixtures. And so there was validation for the high sugar claim for the perennial ryegrass. It increased the amount of sugars, um, NFC and WSC, but the orchard grass probably did not uh, have that, at least in our region, doesn't express higher sugars. Um, energy, I'm just gonna, for time's sake, I'm just gonna quickly say that the bird's foot trefoil increased the amount of energy. And our grasses did differ in energy content, which was one of our objectives. So that's a, that's a plus there. Um, if, if we're trying to increase energy, there are grasses and legumes that can do that in a pasture setting. Moving on to this variable, um, with NDFD, lignin, tannins, bird's foot trefoil percent. Basically, we're talking about bird's foot trefoil. What happens when you add bird's foot trefoil? And if you, these are the um, proportion of bird's foot trefoil. The, the um, perennial ryegrass had the highest proportion of bird's foot trefoil the entire time. And as such, it had the most tannin content in the forage. And <clears throat> Our, our treatments had low condensed tannin content. Um, we expected to have about one to 2%. We were less than 1% in the birth fit tree foil. And then when you mix it, you end up with the down less than 0.5% here. Up here, we're about 0.8%. So, so our tannin content was low, lower than might have expected, but still some was there. Obviously enough to affect, affect it. And then just, I'm just going to quickly say bulk density ended up becoming an important factor in our intake. This is uh, cited often that bite mass increases as bulk density increases. And, and so it's something that I'm concerned about, again, with our, these old pastures as we get thin stands. I, I wanted to make the point that it may be worth it to replace them, to renew them, because we're going to reduce the dry matter intake. That's part of what this research is showing here. So conclusions on, the, on this research part of this project is that uh, if we look at energy and water soluble carbohydrates, grasses had varying levels of energy. The high sugar perennial ryegrass had the greatest water sol soluble carbohydrates and grass, birds with tree, mix, tree, birds with tree foil mixtures had more energy than grass monocultures. Our tannins were there, but they were lower than we might have hoped. Our dry matter intake um, was affected by both physical and nutritive traits. We already said bird's foot tree fill increased intake, especially for metal brome and perennial ryegrass. And in conclusion, then we do believe that the tannins plus the energy had a complementary effect on dry matter intake in pastures. We wanted to validate this um, on farm. And so we had an on-farm trial, the Bingham Dairy Farm there. And, and basically, we took our same treatments and we planted them in strips on Greg's farm. And then he grazed them as he would normally graze for this organic pasture-based dairy, which is listed here. They were rotationally, rotationally grazed, 24-hour grazing period, and the grazing cycle varied depending on the growth of the plant. And then we'd go take samples on each of these and, and measure um, the forage quality. And then we, from the forage quality, we predicted uh, milk production. We couldn't do a dry matter intake here because um, this was more of a preference thing. The animals saw all of these treatments at the same time. And just quickly, the results that come out there. Um, Tall fescue is very productive under irrigated setting in our area and in the West, and it was the most productive on Greg's farm. However, as we, as we had showed in the controlled experimental farm, metal brome and perennial ryegrass had the highest amount of sugars, highest energy, and produced, if you predict from the forage quality, would produce the most milk. Now, Greg told me he wished he was getting 141 pounds per day of milk per cow. These are relative numbers based on this equation. 
So these are these are producing more milk under these treatments, metal brome, birds foot trefoil, perennial ryegrass, birds foot trefoil, than tall fescue birds foot trefoil. However, if you convert that to the amount of milk per acre, tall fescue, I gotta say a good thing about tall fescue because I work on it, it produced the most milk per acre. And this was consistent across the two different years. Um, we had another on-farm trial where we looked at soil amendments and I'm not gonna list those results today, um, but uh, interesting information there also. So I asked Marcus, uh, I asked Marcus, I, I throw this slide in here because when Marcus finished his master's thesis, I said, what did you learn about the on-farm trials? And, and this is what he presented in his defense. He said, producers generally want to improve and participate in research. Successful producers are always learning. Producers have large amounts of real life experience and knowledge to offer. And then he said, but controlling variables can be more difficult. And I throw that out there because I know there are producers listening and I hope that uh, um, I want you to know how important you are to us as we do these research projects. Marcus is now working with a land management agency and he had this great experience working with producers and, and knows that they have a lot of good um, experience to offer to him. And I encourage, you, I encourage you to work with researchers to help answer these questions. So, some concluding thoughts on this research. Um, our previous research, in our previous research, the, um, the herbage, the traits, the nutritive value, the heights, the yield, they ended up, it ended up explaining 50% of the differences among the, be the beef steer weight gains. In this research, I haven't presented the heifer data that will be presented later by um, Jacob Hadfield. But when I run this analysis, our herbage traits explain 50% of the differences in the heifer weight gains. So we have two different studies, two different pastures, treatments, species, different cattle breeds. What does that mean? Does it mean that uh, gra grazing based operation is 50% dependent on pasture and 50% on cattle genetics? I think that the data is starting to lead us there. And I, I remind my producers that are participating with us, my neighbors, my friends, that they have to be both, if you're gonna be a successful pasture-based dairy producer, you have to be an excellent dairy herdsman and an excellent grass farmer. You can't be one, just one or the other. And the data is suggesting that would be the case. In fact, it's amazing that seems to be almost 50%, 50%. Um, I guess I, I, I joke with people, it justifies my existence as a forage breeder and it just of, justifies my colleagues' existence as uh, animal researchers. But that, that's kind of where we seem to be le leading. And with that, I think I'm at 42 minutes. I'll, I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Okay, thank you, Blair. That was a great presentation. Coming in to the Q&A box here. So um, here's one. Um, would adding other legumes such as alfalfa or clover have similar results as bird's foot trefoil? So um, definitely, we believe, definitely the literature shows adding a legume is going to have, um, going to increase some um, dry matter intake and increased performance. And so, um, let's see, where did that question go? Alfalfa and clover are definitely gonna um, help there. We, we chose the um, birth of a trefo based on the gold standard from our previous study. Mike Peel, who is gonna present um, about establishing legumes, will kind of go over all the different legumes and how they might uh, the pluses and minuses to the different legumes that could be added. Um, hopefully that answers that question. I'm gonna say yes, the answer is yes, but. And, and the one but, the one reason that we used bird's foot trefoil is because of its non-bloating. And the literature is showing that the condensed tannins also have an environmental effect. And that was the other part of our research which will be presented later, reduced nitrogen leaching as you change the nitrogen from 
the urine to the uh, manure. So that's that, that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a question about whether this is ongoing research and whether other breeds are also being examined. So um, the we have just we're just initiating a new project where we're looking at breeds and and so we were excited about that um, now we're, we've taken these same type of pastures and looking at Holsteins and Jerseys and Holstein Jersey crosses and Swedish Red Montbilliard Holstein crossbreds um, again farmer driven Greg Bingham has these breeds on his herd he believes there's, they have different uh, grazing efficiencies and we want to document that and pretty much there's a lot of anecdotal data out there saying that's the case but not very much uh, actual research that's saying what what is the best grazing breed for di for pasture based dairy okay um, can you go over the use of the pasture plate meter in more detail to explain how you came up with reliable results of dry matter intake? Yes, um, so the, the, the pasture plate meter is a, an instrument um, that you can buy and it has a plate with a rod that goes down through the center and as you push down with that rod then the forage pushes the um, um, plate up and it measures how many centimeters actually it's measuring how many centimeters that plate sits at so it's measuring the density or the compressed height of that forage and it, and what you do is you can go along and push that down and like we we would walk a w pattern within each paddock and get a 30 count average so there you're not just having to measure under a, a small area you get this 30 count average However, we did sample under a, a number of those um, pasture plates, cut all the forage off, and then we would weigh that, and then we regress that actual weight with the value that the pasture plate meter gave us. And when we regress that, then you come up with an equation so you can um, estimate how much dry matter is in there based on the pasture plate measurements, the average pasture plate measurement. And the thing that's a little different that we did is we said if there was, if at zero centimeters, there's zero forage. And that's one thing that dry, drove, made it so more so much more reliable for us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, also I just want to mention that eOrganic has a video um, by Sarah Flack on how to use a rising plate meter. So if someone would like to look at that, you can find that on our YouTube channel as well as on our website at the link on your screen. Um, okay, so another question, what is the average precipitation of your test sites and were the pastures irrigated? I think you mentioned a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so our test sites um, both um, the research experiment station and the on-farm trials are, are semi-arid. We, we get about 16 to 18 inches of precip a year, primarily though as snow. And so uh, we have a dry season from June to August with very little precipitation. During, so our main grazing season has no um, natural precipitation and so they, it is an irrigated pasture setting. And these pastures were irrigated they were irrigated with three inches of supplemental water every 10 days. Okay, great. Um, can you comment on the difference you found between tall fescue having better milk yield per acre than the combination of meadow brome and bird's foot trefoil and perennial ryegrass and bird's foot trefoil? So that was, that's strictly based on um, there being more tall fescue. As I mentioned early on in my seminar, my, my, I, I accused Greg Bingham of not putting enough cows out there to eat all the tall fescue because it was producing more than, than the um, uh, meadow brome and the perennial ryegrass. And so the meadow brome um, is a high producer also, but it, it was just a little bit less than the tall fescue. And so that, that was based on per acre is because it produced more. It's still a high quality grass, not as high as these other ones, but it, it produced more milk per acre based on a, uh, you would have a higher stocking rate 
more cows out there could be eating it. Okay. Um, in the concluding thoughts, it was stated that performance was influenced by about 50% by pasture forage and about 50% by cattle genetics. So the question is, does the 50% attributed to cattle genetics also include an influence of management by the producers, such as grazing skill, et cetera? That's a very good question very and a very good observation and thought there. Um, yeah, I, I really, I don't know what the 50%, I, I was surmising, I'm sorry, I, maybe I extrapolated too far. What I do find it out is 50% of it is pasture forage. There's another 50% that I don't know. It may be genetics. We may find that out when we do the breed study. It may be total management as, as you're suggesting here. There may be some management issues there. Um, it, some people say, well, it's gonna be weather. But that, I, I, as I thought more about that, I thought, well, we're looking, all of these animals are seeing the same weather conditions. So I'm not sure that's the case. There's 50% that's not explained, and I think part of it's genetics, and part of it's gonna be other things. So, yeah. Okay. Um, is seven days a typical rotation in the West? It would be considered continuous more than rotational in the East. I'd be as interested in differences between rotational times as in differences between forages. Good, good question. And, and um, seven days is, if it, as you start looking through the literature, seven days is a very typical rotation for um, beef production. And, and probably is too long for dairy production. 24 hour, 48 hour is much more common in producing herds. Um, but the, we were using heifers and because of some constraints that we did have on um, labor and, and moving that many different groups of animal every day, we, we did seven. Our new, our new studies that we're starting, we've reduced that down um, to two or three days, try to get closer to what producing herds are at. But yes, it is, uh, it's more typical for beef production, um, let, but 24 hour or 48 day rotation would be um, better for dairy and more typical. Okay. Um, is there any truth to the statement that the fear of bloat causes more loss production than bloat itself? If so, does the bird's foot trefoil offer anything other than producer comfort? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I dare answer that one. So <laughs> there's definitely some producer comfort there. Um, I, I'm thinking of, I have my own pastures and I have their mix of, of tall fescue, alfalfa, and birdfoot trefoil. And, and when I put animals out on my pastures, there is a great comfort that comes to me knowing that there's some trefoil out there and some condensed tannins even if it looks like my alfalfa is starting to increase. So I have to say there is some producer comfort, never bloated an animal. Um, I mean, and you only have to, you, you as producers know this, that you only have to go out once and see a field of bloated animals to um, be sick and decide you're not gonna use that forage anymore. So probably a little bit of insurance there. However, birds with tree foil in itself, there are studies showing that birch foot trefoil with that condensed tannin increased milk production, increased growth. And again, we did talk about the, um, the environmental aspects of it, uh, changing, changing what's happening with the uh, uh, protein in the animal. It, bind, it binds that protein up so it doesn't go straight through. And so there's some other reasons to use birch foot trefoil that we think anyway. Um, what benefits are there to soil health with bird's foot trefoil? Um, that's a good question, and, and I'm hoping that Dr. Mike Peel is listening to these questions, and <laughs> he adds this stuff to his seminar about legumes, or his webinar about legumes. Okay, uh, there's another one about um, benefits to pollinators. I don't know if you've been looking at that as well. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Mike for sure talk about pollinators and, and about the soil health. I'll just... Mentioned that birds foot trefoil is a legume that fixes nitrogen. In fact, one of the um, one of the things that happened in the West with birds foot trefoil is is that the, it did not uh, get inoculated with the right um, rhizobium in many cases, and so it kind of got a bad name. 
because it dies out if out the right, right rhizobium. It's not the same rhizobium as alfalfa. And so if you fix it, if it has the right rhizobium inoculation, it fixes nitrogen to, and adds to the soil. It is a long-lived legume um, and, and seems to be very persistent for us. Um, so we're, we're at, so that's one reason we use it is because we're not putting as much nitrogen on and there's the economic benefit of that. And, and, and hopefully we're complementing those grasses. It's hopefully giving some grasses to the, uh, sorry, some nitrogen to the grasses. Some studies suggest that it does a better job of that than alfalfa. Alfalfa might produce more nitrogen, atmospheric, fix more nitrogen, but some studies suggest it doesn't share it as well as the first foot trefoil. So thoughts there. Okay. Um, were the cows supplemented with any additional forages, um, such as conserved forages or grain mixes? A good question. Um, and, and in this study, they were not. They had a mineral supplement, but, uh, 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 but that's all. They did not receive any additional forage or grain. Okay. Um, was sanfoin ever considered instead of bird's foot trefoil? Um, Samphoin is a great legume um, used commonly in our area, um, and Michael addressed this. One thing is it's not really adapted to this irrigated setting that we were um, using, here, that we had here. And so not, it wasn't considered for this, but uh, I think Mike will talk about it in his webinar about where it could be used. Okay. Um, do you have any scientific articles published on this research yet? And if so, in what journal? So the, the particular research I presented, that is just being prepared for publication and it, and it will go out and, and you can send me an email and I'll let you know as soon as it gets published. Um, the previous research with the beef steers using these, uh, using the mixtures, that was just published in the journal Grasslands. And that was just a recent publication. Okay, yeah, and we're hoping that we can um, provide links to any of the abstracts of journal publications on this website on your screen, eorganic.info slash dairy forages once they come out. So um, let's see, another question. Um, would the results have been different without the irrigation every 10 days? Uh, that's a yes. That's a they would they would have been different. How they would have been different, I don't know exactly. But uh, some these forages were not are not adapted to going in our region without irrigation. Tall fescue might have been the only forage available for them out there. Well, metabrom somewhat drought tolerant too. Birds foot trefoil would not have been near as prevalent, and perennial ryegrass would not have produced anything in our region without the irrigation. Okay, um, you talked about a rest period in the fall for bird's foot trefoil. How long is, would that rest period be? So um, that recommend, what we recommend and, and find good um, success with is, is a, a 20 to 30 day rest period during, um, for us it's late September, and you're trying to time that rest period just before the first hard frost. After and the reason for that, and Mike will talk about this again, is that first foot trefoil does not put down reserves in the roots to prepare for the dormant season like alfalfa does. Alf I mean, alfalfa does that all season long. First foot trefoil only does it in the fall as the date length changes and as temperature changes. And so you have to give it a chance to put, get, build up those root reserves. And so we're try trying to time that right before that hard frost. And then it can be grazed after the hard frost with no problem but it has to have that, once that growing, once the frost stops the growing, it can be grazed and, and becomes very persistent. So, yeah. Okay, um, here's another question. The statement about on-farm research trials and less ability to control variables is true, but many grazing farmers are experimenting with multi-species forage mixtures with multiple grasses, two or more legumes, and multiple forbs. Any thoughts about diversity in pasture forage mixtures? That's a great that's a great comment and and I I agree 100% on all of the our on farm um, 
our, our producers, our participating producers, they have different pastures with different mixtures, multiple forbs, multiple legumes, multiple grasses. I think that's the way to go. We, because this is research, we were trying to control them to just basically a binary mixture so we could say what was happening with the grass, what was happening with the birds with tree foil. Um, my thoughts are, yeah, you want a diverse pasture mix. You hedge your bet um, based on the soil type, based on the environment, based on grazing. One thing that we're maybe <clears throat> discouraging somewhat, and this doesn't, this study didn't look a lot at preference, but you, you um, if you put a low, a high preferred forage with a low preferred forage, you may end up with that uh, end of the low preferred forage in the end because they don't need it, and and that that would be in this case it was tall fescue, so sometimes we don't recommend tall fescue in those mixtures but we recommend tall fescue pastures for other reasons. Um, in our area, I recommend it for a, a midsummer pasture because it's one of the grasses that keeps growing during the heat of the summer with a little bit of water and, and helps make up for that midsummer slump. Okay, well, it looks like um, we've gone through all the questions here. So I'd like to thank everyone for all these great questions, as well as posting some additional informational resources here on bird's foot trefoil. Thank you very much. And um, as I said, we have another dairy webinar coming up on January 28th on milk fatty acids. And we definitely look forward to more webinars from this research team in the coming months. So thank you so much, Blair, for giving this presentation and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you.